change in Tel Aviv. Uh, the uh, Agap, our Institute for Contemporary Affairs, which was established with the uh, Wexler Family Foundation uh, of the Jerusalem Center for Public Affairs. Uh, today we have a very special guest uh, who will be speaking to us, the Minister of Finance of Israel, Yuval Steinitz. Just a word of background because we really have a very special uh, person speaking today. Of course, today he's the Minister of Finance of Israel and a member of the uh, Security Cabinet of the Israeli government. But he comes with a background that I have to just point out to you uh, if you're not aware of it. Yuval Steinitz was, of course, the uh, chairman of the Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense Committee for many years, and probably in Israel's history, its most active head of, of initiated uh, inquiries uh, into aspects of Israel's national security uh, doctrine and uh, the whole question of the uh, uh, Second Gulf War. He also, of course, headed the uh, intelligence subcommittee within the uh, Knesset Foreign Affairs and Defense uh, Committee. Professor Yuba, uh, Dr. Yuval Steinitz comes with a very rich academic background in the philosophy department, what we've gained in the Israeli political system. The philosophy departments in the state of Israel have lost because he's an author of two books on, two books on philosophy that are widely used by philosophers and highly acclaimed. Um, let me just also note today that... What happened to uh, the other Four books. The page got cut in facts, you know. Um, the, uh, we have also with us today um, Mr. Harry Wexler and his wife Ruth, uh, his daughter Dada, and his son-in-law Larry, who are, are joining us for this uh, particular session. And we thank them for uh, being here with us. Uh, today's discussion will be um, how to build a stable economy in an unstable region. But I think we'll also use the opportunity to hear from uh, Minister Steinitz a little bit about the um, Obama Netanyahu summit, which just went on in Washington, of course, and he's been fully briefed on. And uh, we will also want to hear something about the uh, new changes and how Israel is uh, uh, getting its budget approved on a biannual basis. And uh, so without uh, wasting further time, I will turn over the floor to uh, Mr. Steinitz. Thank you, Thank you Dolly, and thank you all of you for attending. It's been a pleasure to be here today. I'm so busy with a budget, you know, it's the busiest and most difficult time for finance minister. Just one week before the voting in the government on the of uh, the next two years' budget, so it's uh, some kind of uh, of uh, rest, <laughs> of little vacation to be here today for one hour, and uh, to be able to ignore for one hour all the difficulties within the government and the new uh, budget. Of course, I'll uh, focus mainly on the economy, and then I hope you will have some time for questions. Questions and answers, but may, let me start really with a, a summit this week in Washington. I'm very satisfied of the summit. I think uh, the atmosphere seems to be very good, but still more important are two uh, major achievements. I think that Netanyahu is coming back with two important achievements for this uh, uh, summit. One is the recognition the adoption of the Israeli position that uh, Israel and the Palestinians should come back as soon as possible, immediately, to direct talks between the two sides and that this is the best um, method to try to promote a genuine peace process. Uh, this is important. We always thought that only direct talks between the two sides can uh, help us to promote peace and to resolve our difficulties. And this seems to be now the attitude of the, of the American administration as well. And this is important. More important, maybe, even, is a declaration
regulation of the willingness uh, to cooperate uh, with Israel on civilian nuclear technologies. Uh, this is a, a breakthrough. It's going in the direction of comparing uh, the status of Israel to that of India. And it includes a very clear recognition in the of Israel as very, very responsible and reliable uh, with, with regard to nuclear technologies, uh, despite the fact that Israel, like India, is not uh, a member of the NPT. I think those are two very important uh, uh, results of the summit. And when we are uh, be back probably tomorrow, I shall hear more details about the talks uh, between Netanyahu and Obama and other people in uh, Washington. Next week I'm going to uh, deliver in the government a new uh, two years budget. And I want to speak a little bit about the of the title is how to remind me the title of the accurate title. Totally good. The title is Building a Stable Economy in an Unstable Region. Ah, okay, building a stable economy in an unstable region. So uh, it's exactly like building a stable economy in an unstable world or in an unstable global economy. Uh, it boils down to the same mission. Stable is stable vis-a-vis -vis any crisis of difficulties, whether they are economic crisis or security crisis. Uh, stable is stable. And uh, we did handle uh, the last crisis, the global crisis, in a very different way than most other countries. And let me elaborate a little bit how we handled the crisis in Israel, and as it seems now, with pretty good results, at least in relative to most other developed countries. In most of the world, especially most of the developed world, governments' attitude to the crisis two years ago, a year and a half ago, especially after the collapse of Lehman Brothers, September 2008, they treated the crisis uh, very similar to the way that we treat a person that is lying on the floor uh, uh, without uh, breathing. If, unfortunately, somebody will fall on the floor and will not uh, breathe, what will be our first reaction to such a situation? To give him emergency treatment. And the first priority will be to give oxygen, uh, to make sure that he will get oxygen to his lungs, to his brain. So we will run to him and we will give him mouse-to-mouse -mouse resuscitation. And if we will have an oxygen a mask, we will put also an oxygen mask on him. The first priority will be to make sure that he will get air, that he will get oxygen, that he will be able to survive. Later on, we will rush into the hospital and then they will be diagnosed. But initially, it's not important if, it's a, if he had a heart attack or a stroke or, or psychiatric or, 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 or panic uh, trauma or something like that. It's not important, he's not breathing. We will run to him and we will give him oxygen or mouse to mouse resuscitation. This was exactly the attitude of most governments in the West or in the world vis a vis the global crisis after the collapse of human brothers. The common wisdom was that the economy is lying on the floor, not breathing. Uh, there was sharp decline in economic activity, in economic activities from all kinds. There was real panic, there was a credit crunch, 
banks would not lend money because they would be afraid that people will not be able to to pay it back. People and companies would not borrow money because they would be afraid that maybe they won't be able to pay it back. Uh, people would not invest, will not buy new houses because maybe prices will go down in the future as well, so it's better to be careful. Companies will not enlarge their businesses because maybe they will have to shrink and they won't have enough uh, revenues in order to justify it. So actually, a year and a half ago, there was a global panic, and in such global panic, the problem is that everybody, both financial institutions, real uh, 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 businesses, and even the private sector, even private people, will hold all the cards, all their money very close, will not spend it, will not invest it, and then you see sharp decline in economic activities all over the world. And uh, the feeling was that it's like somebody that lost his conscience and he's not breathing anymore. That if this will proceed, economy might get into very long recession or depression or coma, and therefore, governments around the globe did exactly what we do if somebody is falling on the floor and need emergency treatment. They run to the economy, to the local economies, and they gave them mouse-to-mouse -mouse resuscitation. The idea was with the government in the United States or in Europe or even in China to a certain extent, we have to give our economy mouse-to-mouse -mouse resuscitation. We have to give the economy oxygen to pull as much oxygen as possible into the economy, into the uh, business sector in order to revive economic activities, in order to move it, in order to make sure that economy is not dying or not getting into very long depression or coma. And oxygen in economy needs money. So when government wanted to pour oxygen to the economy, they pour a lot of extra money into the economy, oxygen, in order to save the economy. By three main methods. One was reducing tax. If you reduce tax, if you take less money from people and from companies, it's like giving more money to people. You leave more money for people to consume, you give more money for companies to, to, to preserve their activities. So the first method was immediately to reduce tax. Bush, this was his first reaction after the collapse of Lehman Brothers. I think two weeks later he came with a new program of tax reduction to give oxygen to the economy. The second method was to save failing companies with government money. Banks like Citibank, Bank of America, uh, insurance companies like AIG, and even uh, industries like car industries and other, mostly in the United States, but later on also in Europe, and to a certain extent also in Japan and in other countries in the East. Again, you give you pull extra oxygen, extra government money into the economy by sending those companies with government money, not with private money. And the third method was a very large stimulus plans increasing government investment in infrastructure, building roads, railroads, airports, schools, universities, parks, uh, you name it, power stations and so on and so forth, investing more extra government money, more than usual, in infrastructure. So by those three methods, governments all uh, around the world gave extra oxygen, extra money into the economy in 2008 and 2009 and even 2010. So the real Attitude was 
the situation is so serious, we have to give money now to the economy, and we will have to pay it later on. So actually, we are sacrificing our future in few years' time in order to save the economy at present, because this is crucial. This is an emergency. The problem with it is that money costs money. So if you pour a lot of extra money into the economy in present, it will be very expensive in the future. This was clear from the outset. But in an emergency, maybe this is the right attitude. So the general attitude was we sacrifice the future economy in order to save the economy at present. And the understanding was that in one year time, two years time, three years time, we will have to pay back all the deficits, all the extra money that we now spend. But it is an emergency. We in Israel, we adopted a totally different attitude to the crisis. We are not sacrificing the future in order to save the present. We are giving priority to the future. We take care of the future in order to save the economy in present. The idea was that if we will be able to convince our people to convince the business sector that in few years' time it's going to be better and that we the government we focus not on the current crisis but we give priority <coughs> already to the recovery <coughs> stage. This will be good not just in the future but there will be ramifications already at present. This will encourage economy at present better than simply pulling money in present. So the idea was, the attitude was totally different. Not sacrificing the future for the sake of the present, but saving the future in order also to save the present. How did we do it? We gave clear priority to long-term plans. To longer terms, plans than usual even. Instead of focusing on the short range emergency situation. We took some steps also, some immediate steps, but those were very minor steps. For example, when in the United States, actually, there was a new budget every few months, because if you submit several hundred billion dollars uh, in an emergency plan, this is actually it's the size of actually, it's almost a new budget, and so it's happened also in some other countries. We went to two years budget. The first two years budget in our history, the first two years budget in the history of the world, at least the history of the developed world. And the idea is the two years budget, this extraordinary, exceptional move in the middle of the crisis, I uh, declared that it's going to be two years budget even before I became finance minister. When, uh, one month before, when I was still the head of Netanyahu's transition team, and I focused about ways and means to handle the crisis, I already recommended that our first move will be shifting to two years budget. And the idea was to tell the country to tell the business community, look, there are a lot of uncertainties, a lot of panic, but look, with the government we feel confident enough to plan, not for half a year, but for two years instead of one year. We feel confident enough. And we shall show you that we will keep the ammunition not just to the middle of the crisis, but already that we can already plan the recovery stage and we keep some of the ammunition, some of our capacities to the recovery phase in one year, year and a half. 
So we came with two years budget in order to, uh, uh, to, to give some confidence, some rest, some calm to the markets, to the business sector. Look, we the government, we feel so confident. And we are so focused also on the future and not just on the present that we are going for exceptional two years budget in the middle of the crisis, despite the uncertainties. Secondly, we came with totally different tax policy than most of the world. In most of the world, in the middle of the crisis, government reduced tax rapidly in order to leave more money, more oxygen to the economy to function, to people to consume, to companies to survive, not to fight. But with a clear understanding that if you now reduce tax for one year or two years, later on you will have to raise them back, and even above the initial level, in order to compensate for the deficits. Because if you reduce tax, you give extra money to companies, you invest more in infrastructure, in 2009, 2010, it's very clear that in 2011 or 2012, you will have to raise tax to begin to close the deficits. So this was the logic. First, we reduced tax in most of the world. Even in China, they didn't suffer so much from the crisis. They reduced tax in order to stimulate the economy at present. You have to save it at present, but then it will go up. We did exactly the opposite. I raised tax in the middle of the crisis, mainly indirect tax, uh, the VAT, and some other uh, indirect tax in the middle of the crisis for two years. When everybody reduced, I raised tax. I became under enormous criticism. But the idea was that I'm raising tax now, but I'm coming at the same time with clear commitment to seven years tax reduction plan. Graduate tax reduction plans plan going until 2016, and both corporate tax, corporate tax are going gradually from 26% to 18% until 2016. And uh, income tax, individual tax, are going down from 46% to 39% gradually through those six or seven years. So we did exactly the opposite. When everybody reduced, we raised, but when everybody now, one year from now, we begin to raise. In Europe, everybody is now raising tax. We are going down. We went up in the middle of the crisis in order to go down in the future when everybody is going up. And the idea was that this will give us some advantage because we will go down and everybody will go up and we should open some gap in favor of Israel, the Israeli economy. But still more important, the idea was the tax, future tax reductions, if they are reliable, are more important than immediate tax reduction. Because the business sector is looking more to the future. So we told our people, look, it's now difficult and we're going to make it even more difficult with some tax uh, 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 rising. But in a few years' time, it is going to be much better for you. Don't fire people. You are going to make more profit. Life are going to be easier, not now, in the recovery phase. So those are just two examples, but the focus was we are giving less government money in present in order to secure the recovery phase in two years, three years' time. We told our people we are keeping the ammunition. We are not spending all the ammunition now. At the peak of the crisis, we are keeping a lot of ammunition to the recovery phase. In it, we took some other means in addition to it. We get very generous government guarantees to exporters, not money, but guarantees. Until now, we didn't have to pay anything. Uh, we gave some extra money to research and development but very little in comparison to other countries, really almost insignificant extra money. We reached a package deal with the employers and employees, with the Istadrut, with the unions and the uh, employers in order to create some kind of industrial coming in the middle of the crisis. 
and it did well. All those together served as very efficient stimulus play, very cheap, because it cost us nothing in 2009, 2010, and still the effect was very positive. Actually, it's an idea I took from philosophy, from my philosophical background. Uh, Aristotle, already 2,200 years ago, in ancient Greek, he distinguished between two kinds of causalities. Of causality. There is a regular causality, he said, that cause is always prior or early to the effect. First you have the cause and then you have the effect, of course. Cause is the cause of the effect, so it must be before, it must come before the effect. This is regular causality that you can find in nature. So cause and effect, cause is always prior in time to the effect. But Aristotle said in human activities, if you have uh, an agent that have a knowledge and, and conscious of, of, of the time sequence and of the future, and he have plans and ambitions to the future, then you have also opposite, backward causation, going from future situations, from a hypothetical future situation to present. Because if I want to achieve something in one year time or two years time, I will change my current behavior in order to achieve it. So actually our future goals or apes are already having some impact on our behavior at the present. So Aristotle said in human activities you have also backward causation. Going from future to present. The cause is in the future, is something you want to achieve, is hypothetical future circumstances or situations, and the effect is already in present. It's changed your behavior. It's known in economy, it's not new in the economy, like economy of expectations. If you expect prices to go down, you will not buy now, now you will wait. If you expect prices to go up, you will buy now in order not to pay uh, a more late. But we took this principle that is limited only to, to, to prices and, 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 and until now we made it a basic principle in our attitude to the crisis. In economy, Future is more important than present. And future is even more influential at present than present, than what you do in present. So I believe, the idea was we are not sacrificing the future in order to save the present, because if it will be clear that we are sacrificing the future already, it might have some negative ramifications at present. On the contrary, it's difficult at present, we are focusing it on future on the recovery phase. And if we will come with reliable plans, longer range plans, this will save economic activity in presence. This will resolve the panic, which is the source of all difficulties at present. And this was our attitude. It was a totally different attitude than most other countries. I had to swallow a lot of criticism because everybody, including some prominent economists in Israel, when I was appointed almost a year and a half ago, they told me, what you are speaking about? Look to Obama, look to Gordon Brown, look to Britain, look to England, look to France, look to China, to Japan, and do the same. But we insisted on doing almost the opposite. And today it is widely agreed that this was the right uh, attitude especially when we look to the difficulties in Europe. Now they are paying uh, for their policy one or two years ago uh, without uh, remarkable recovery. I want to say to Adam in another word just about the two years budget because it's my intention and the Knesset already approved it for the next two years. 2011 and 12, but it's my intention that this will be routine in Israel for good. 
I thought of the two years budget, not only as a mean to counter the crisis, but long ago, when I was still professor of philosophy at the University of Haifa. Originally, I focused on, uh, not on economy and not on political philosophy, but my main field of expertise, my books are on metaphysics, philosophy of science, logic, uh, epistemology. But uh, 14 years ago, I was asked, two professors went uh, to sabbatical abroad, and uh, they asked me also to give one course or seminar to do something with philosophy of, of, of uh, uh, you know, with, with, with philosophy of economy or, or, or philosophy of politics or something like that. Social sciences, something that in order that there would be something also in this. So I gave one year seminar, MA seminar, uh, entitled The Philosophy of Democracy. And in this seminar, one of the questions that I raised with my students was what is the right time cycle for modern politics and for modern states. And we asked the same question on elections and political cycle. Should it be four years, three years, five years? What, what is right and wrong? What should be the right, the reasonable political time cycle? But we asked the same question about economy. And it's immediately occurred to me only but you thinking that, because I never thought that I'm going to, to be a member of Knesset and to do in politics, or the more so to be finance minister. But on a purely logical base, it's immediately occurred to me that one year budget, 12 months budget, although this is common around the globe for 100 or maybe 200 years, this is totally illogical and unreasonable to have one year budget. Terrible logical mistake. And I want to explain to you why. But I'll start with an example. Take not two states, because now we are speaking about state budget. Let's leave the state aside the all. Let's think of two companies similar companies, two high-tech companies, or two uh, food companies, or two insurance companies, two similar companies that are adopting different strategy. One is adopting the regular strategy. The regular strategy is that in a company, towards the end of the year, November, December, for one month, you focus on preparing the new budget for the next year, the budget, the plans, the enlargement, efficiency plans. What shall you do in the next year? Where you want to take the company to? Where you are going to make your profit? What you would like to invest in if you want to enlarge by other companies? Maybe to save expenditures, yeah, to, to to reduce activities here and there. So for one month, this is a regular uh, uh, approach, for one month every company is focusing the management, all the branches, on preparing the budget. But the budget is not just the budget, it's everything. The plans, the strategy, the tactic, where to enlarge, where to uh, uh, shrink or to, to reduce activity, to reduce uh, human power, and so on and so forth. It goes together. So all the company, although they continue with the regular activities to sell or to produce, but the focus is preparing, debating the new plans for the next year, the new budget, the new efficiency plans, the new strategical plans, and so on and so forth. And then, after approving it, after voting and approving it in the board, 
board of directors for 12 months, the next year is coming for 12 months, the company is focusing on executing its plans and budget. This is company number A or strategy number A. This is a common strategy. But not, let's assume that company number B, company B, is very similar to A, suddenly decide to change strategy. And company B is saying to itself, uh, the management, why spending only one month on preparing the plans and the budget for the next year? Let's stretch it for six months or eight months. So eight months, we shall prepare, we shall focus on preparing our plans and our budget for the next year. Of course, we shall resume with regular activities, but the focus, a lot of manpower, a lot of focus, a lot of attention will be focused on this. And after we finish it, for 12 months, we shall execute our plans. But we won't focus on executing our plans. Because again, for those 12 months, eight months, we we'll already focus on the next year plan. So we will not entirely focus on performances and executing our plans maybe for four months. And again and again. It's very clear which company will win the competition if we will take two similar companies. It's very clear that company B, strategy B, will kill company B in one year or two years or maximum three years. It's so clear that strategy B is so, is totally irrational, illogical, unreasonable, that you cannot find even one company in the stock market, one company, company one big company, that will adapt now to a strategy B. Because it will kill it in few years' time. Now, my question is simple. If it's so clear that strategy B is totally unreasonable in case of companies. Totally illogical. I ask my students, how can it be that it will be reasonable or logical for, for the state, for the country? If it's illogical, it's illogical. If it's illogical to spend almost the same time on plans and budget plans, and then just very little time to fulfill your place, to work it up. And it's illogical also on the state level. So what states are doing all over the world, I argue with my students, it's totally unreasonable. To have one year budget, it's totally unreasonable because in modern state, it takes six months, minimum six months, usually it's eight or nine months, to finish all the preparations. The state is much bigger, it's a different scale than companies, and you have all the democratic system, and you have to debate it in the government, in the parliament, and the judicial system sometimes will interfere. It's take time. No state is doing its budget in one month's time. But the result is totally unreasonable, as we agreed before. Either you can squeeze the process also on the state level to one month. So for one month we will focus on your plans and for 12 or 11 months, because then you will, you will have to spend another month, for 11 months of executing your plans. But this is impossible. In a modern state you cannot squeeze the entire process of the budget uh, and, and the plans for one month. You have the parliament, you have branches, you have different parties, you have a uh, Supreme Court, at least in Israel, he might interfere very easily. Or, in order to make, to have a logical ratio between plans and executing the, your plans, or if you cannot squeeze the process to one or two months, you have to enlarge the, the spending, the, the executing time. You have to go for multi years budget. Because the ratio between focusing on plans and then executing the plans cannot be one to one. Not even one to two, it should be one to three, three or one to four minimum, if not one to ten. So then, already in university, I came to the conclusion that it's totally unreasonable to have one year budget, although the entire world is doing it. 
and that it will be more reasonable, more logical to move to multi-use budgets, speaking on states and not on companies. So I have the opportunity to become finance minister of Israel in the peak of the crisis. And this helped, this helped me you know, to convince people that this is time for new experiments. I argued strongly that this will help us also to handle the crisis. And now we have already not just theoretical, logical argument, but already some findings, some feedback. And the feedback is beyond my expectation. The feedback is so good and so clear that this is so good, so successful, so efficient to the government and also to the public sector, that I can tell you that a few months ago, there was a gathering of all the general directors in the government, 30 of them, yes. We have 30 ministers now. And they were asked who want to proceed with another two years budget and who want to go back to one year budget. And they voted on it. What do you think were the results? And many of them are serving already five years or 10 years as general directors in, the, in different government ministerials. You know what were the results? How many wish to go back to the, as some of them called it, to the dark times of one year budget? I won't tell you how many wanted to go back to one year budget. I can tell you that 70 voted in order to have another two years budget. And uh, we have only 30, it's quite a lot, uh, in ministry. To my uh, amazement, and uh, surprise, good surprise, also the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, and the OECD uh, examined it. In the beginning, they were shocked by this two years budget in the middle of the crisis. But uh, recently, both important organizations announced that they do support another two years budget in Israel. And, uh, uh, Dominic Strauss-Kahn, the head of the IMF, the chairman of the IMF, even declared that the IMF thinks that this is good not just to Israel, but the IMF is going to recommend to all developed countries to adapt the Israeli model and to move to two years budget because they were convinced that this is so more reasonable and efficient than one year budget. Okay, so this is just a, a short explanation about uh, and the logic and also the positive experience that we have in two years budget already and now there is some room for a few questions uh, that is. And Minister Stein, it's a question about diplomacy and economy with respect to our neighbors, the Palestinians. Prime Minister Netanyahu had spoken uh, for many months about the concept of economic peace which now seems to have taken a backseat to the international pressures for direct negotiations and, in fact, the Israeli interest in direct negotiations. But I'd like to ask you, as a Minister of Finance, is the Palestinian economy stable and viable enough, in your view, to, to go to these direct talks at this point, um, or is it missing the very foundation of a stable economy and might require some years of, of infrastructure building in order to make the logic jump of, as you've talked about today, of planning for tomorrow, of planning for today by uh, using the cause of tomorrow to reach the success today? Look, I, I, it's very difficult to answer such a question, and I'll tell you why. First, let me return shortly to the economic piece. Uh, it's really remarkable, I think, that Netanyahu's government made very serious, even dramatic gestures vis a vis the Palestinians, and it's very frustrating to see that. There is very minimal recognition in the world to those very dramatic and one could say even unexpected gestures. The first was the economic peace, the Palestinian economy due to many steps that we took, including lifting barriers and, and checkpoints, including other helping to facilitate import and export to the West Bank and, and, and other means. The Palestinian economy is boosting 
And in 2009, it was growing in a tempo of 10% before it was totally paralyzed. And it's continued to grow also in 2010. So the Palestinian economy is now boosting, and this is due to Netanyahu's new policy vis a vis the Palestinians. It didn't happen in Ulmer Livni time. And the Palestinians do admit it. Still, it's not stable. And no economy is stable in the Middle East, and no economy is totally stable in this global atmosphere. And uh, with regard to the Palestinian economy, you can say that it's still far behind the Israeli economy or the level of other Western countries' economy. But it's much more successful and prosperous, and the standard of living in the West Bank is much higher than other Palestinians or Arabs living just 20 kilometers across the border in Jordan or in Syria or in Egypt. So it's doing much better than most other Arab countries in the vicinity, not to compare with very little, but uh, oil uh, yeah, countries like Kuwait or Bahrain or Qatar or Abu Dhabi. Yeah. But if you compare the Palestinian economy and also the standard of living, the average standard of living, in the West Bank to Jordan or to Egypt or to Syria or to Iraq or to Libya, it's much higher and it's growing much faster as well than all other Arab economies. The other gesture was, of course, the uh, very clear uh, declaration of Netanyahu's willingness to have two-state solution. And the third was the freezing of the settlement, which was very, and is very difficult for us, a 10 months freezing on uh, building in the settlements. I think it is extremely problematic from Israeli point of view, from moral point of view, but we took this uh, uh, decision, which is very hard and very costly. So we made, in one year time, three dramatic gestures vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinians. Uh, it's frustrating from Israeli point of view that instead of looking now to the other side and asking the Palestinians, now what do you do? Where is some reciprocity? vis-a-vis -vis Israel, if you cannot do a, a, a real state, a, a, a stage at least in, in, in the declaration phase, where is your recognition of Israel as it was established as a Jewish homeland, as it was established by the UN in 1947? Where is your recognition of Israel, of Israel's right to secure borders? Where is your willingness, at least rhetoric willingness, to make compromises on your side? It's frustrating. Uh, I hope still that we will move to direct talks, despite the fact that, you know, it's difficult to be too optimistic. You look to Gaza, you see that in Gaza, what happened in Gaza after Gaza was delivered to the Palestinian Authority. We didn't deliver Gaza to Hamas or to Iran. It was delivered totally to the Palestinian Authority. They said they are taking control. And they deployed 40,000 policemen there, and look what happened, it became an Iranian outpost, a terrorist Iranian outpost. So Israelis should feel also secure that what happened in Gaza, two years after we pulled out from Gaza, and we uprooted all Israeli settlements and, and, and military uh, 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 garrisons and, and checkpoints, Israelis should have the confidence that it's up to the Palestinians to convince us that this cannot repeat itself in case of peace settlement in the West Bank. So uh, it's not easy to have peace, and especially peace with security. Otherwise, it's not a genuine peace in the Middle East. But we should do our best, and if we will have a reliable and willing partner, hopefully we will be able to promote peace despite uh, yeah, despite some negative uh, uh, reactions on the other side. We have time for one more question, Dr. Um, yes, Aristotle tells us that the form of government or the constitution of the polity is very closely related to its end goal, or what they call a telos, 
the purpose of the democracy, the democracy, for example, is to ensure the good life for its people. And of course, Aristotle recommended it. Conditions of peace. My, I have two questions. Uh, what do you see as the end goal or the telos of the state of Israel? What is the purpose that we stand for and should be working on? And the other thing is, how can our state or our neighbors like the Palestinian Authority uh, have an end goal of peace if they're permanently engaging in a form of political warfare and incitement against us? Oh, okay, you, you are asking uh, very serious uh, questions and I won't be able to elaborate too much, not about Aristotle and not about the, uh, the telos of, of, of uh, Zionism. But uh, generally speaking, I think it's quite clear Israel was established in order to enable Jews to have a little, tiny, minuscule homeland and sovereignty. And until now, uh, clearly this uh, goal was achieved. Of course, we wanted to be more secure. And the best uh, way to have uh, security is to have peace, of course. Unfortunately, Israel, we are sitting in maybe the most difficult, the most dangerous neighborhood on the face of Earth. And the Middle East is not uh, easy for everybody, for everybody, not for us, only more so, not for a little tiny minuscule Jewish democracy. Uh, so uh, we will have to sit here, and if necessary, to defend ourselves, and if possible, to make peace in order to increase security, and it's better for both sides, for Jews and Arabs, uh, for Israel and the uh, Arab states, and also to the Palestinians. But uh, to tell you that I'm confident, look, there is no real sustainable uh, peace even among Arab states and themselves. It's not the European Union in Iran. Uh, there were many clashes and fightings and uh, 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 the Iraqi occupation of uh, Kuwait, Iraq Iran war, uh, you name it, uh, the Syrian Jordan war uh, just a few decades ago. Look what happened in Sudan uh, between Iran and the Arab world. Uh, what happened in Lebanon? Uh, it is not secure, uh, not just for us, but also for Arabs themselves and even among themselves. It's not, uh, uh, we are not yet in, a, in a, the European or, uh, or North uh, America uh, situation. Yet one more chair. One more question in the back. Um, last last question. question. My, my aim is uh, okay. Last question from Hungarian Embassy. Uh, I would like to ask uh, about uh, R and D in, in Israel, which is a very important uh, area of the Israeli uh, infrastructure. What is your view, specifically in the framework of this budget? Uh, whether the support, the government support of R&D was decreased, as I, I have heard, and what is your view generally uh, for the role of, uh, of the state, of the government, in supporting R&D? Okay, uh, R&D in Israel is in good shape, generally speaking. We have number one in the world. Israel is the only country in the world that spend almost 5% of GDP on R&D, and this does include a, a, a security or defense R&D. And so we are already number one in the world in R&D, in the percentage of R&D from our uh, GDP, mostly from the private sector. Today it's less than one percent of, of those five, almost five percent, it's 4.9 percent almost 5%. For the 5% of our GDP that we invest in R&D, it's less than 1% coming from the government and 4% or more coming from the uh, private sector, not just from our private sector, but also from abroad, because many international companies, mainly from the United States, but also from Europe, and now we see even 
maybe new developments from China and from the East, are building some of the most important R&D compounds or, or research area facilities in Israel. And you name it, Intel, it's most important R&D uh, center in the world, including United States, according to Intel chairman just a few months ago, it's in Haifa. The same goes to IBM, Google, Cisco, and Microsoft. Uh, it's not just Israeli companies, like Teva, or like Checkpoint, or Converse, or Nax, or, or others. It's also international giants, mainly in the high-tech industry, that are building some of the most important R&D, and also biggest R&D centers in Israel. Uh, I think it's because, I mean, they are saying that it's because a very high level of Israeli scientists and engineers. And still more important, this special attitude that you can find in Israel to think out of the box. Not just by scientists or engineers, but also by entrepreneurs, by, by investors, by managers. This very special tendency to think out of the box, to think differently, which is a, 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 a very special in Israel. Uh, in the new budget, we took it very seriously. I mean, there is one main mission in the new economic policy. Now, after the crisis or in the recovery stage, I made it very clear that one of our main mission is to preserve our uh, leading position in the advanced industries, in the high-tech industry, but in the broader sense of, 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 the, of the term. Because at least uh, per capita, I mean, if you take the number of, uh, of uh, startups, per capita is the number one in the world. In complete numbers, we are second only to the United States. There are more startups in Israel than in the rest of Europe, which is amazing, little Israel, compared to than in Japan, or than in India. Uh, in, if, if you take advanced industries, we are number one in the world in the place of advanced industries in our economy. 15% of our, uh, our GDP is coming from our advanced industries, and more than 40% of our export is high-tech or advanced industries exports, which is huge. And we have to preserve it. And since we are first, at least in comparison to our size, and even sometimes beyond that, we have to run faster. So one of my main mission as finance minister was to see how we can secure our leading position, our technological edge, and how can we preserve it and even promote it, and deeper it and wider it into the future, because this is the only asset we have, the human uh, uh, intelligence, the human asset, and we have to continue to preserve it in the future, and we came out this very elaborate plan, and we call it a, a relative advantage, how to proceed and to preserve our leading position for the next 10 years in advanced industries. It includes many items, including improving the connection between the academia and those industries, which is pretty good in Israel, but we want to improve it including encouraging Israeli companies and Israeli pension funds to invest in high-tech companies in Israel and not only in real estate uh, in Europe or in America, in the world. It, it, it includes many measures. Uh, it it includes an overall program or plan how to improve our academia, our universities, how to bring Israeli brains from the world, mainly from the United States, back to Israel. Uh, we are the only country in the world that 25% of our uh, uh, professors are teaching in the United States, more than from Canada or Britain, although they are much closer in uh, uh, speaking uh, English nations. We want to absorb back some several thousand Israeli professors and, and doctors and experts in, the, in, in biotech or high-tech and, 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 and many other fields back in Israel, in the Israeli academia or in the Israeli industry. So 
we are going to increase the total investment in other bill, not necessarily government investment. Government investment will remain the same. But we are taking many measures to encourage private companies and also the academia to invest more, including tax reductions, including money we will give to the academia. So indirectly, we are hopefully we are not going only to present the 5% level, but we would like to go to 6 or 7 or even 8% uh, level of investment in, in R&D from our GDP. Uh, as I said, we are number one in R&D, so we have to fast uh, to, to run faster in order to remain at the same uh, relatively good position. Unfortunately, I have to conclude it's one week before the big fast in the government about the budget, and you know it's a coalition uh, system. We have many parties, many partners, many demands, and it's going to be uh, not easy. By the way, I, I will conclude by two sentences about the new budget. So, new two years budget for 2011-2012 that I already submitted to the government, I mean it's a framework and next week we are going to conclude the details and to vote for Unlike many other countries and as I mentioned before, since we didn't spend much extra money, we didn't spend extra hundreds of billions of dollars in 2009-2010, this was not the way we handled the crisis with pouring extra money, much extra money into the system. We don't have now to run to the other extreme and to do what they are doing in Britain or in France or in Greece or in Spain. And the new budget that was already submitted, we are not going to make dramatic cuts. We have the opportunity to add something there will be an addition of uh, 80 billion shekels in the new two years budget. It's significant, but still moderate addition. So looking at Europe, for example, I'm happy that I don't have to make those dramatic cuts now because I didn't make those dramatic extra spending uh, in order to handle the crisis two years ago or one year ago. My main policy is that for the next two years we will invest less in security in the IDF. It's not that we are going to cut, but we will spend most of the uh, additional money on improving the education system, on the academia, on stimulating our industries, our uh, research and development, our high-tech industries, so the main focus this time will be less on extra money for security. There will be some extra money for security, even in those two years, but less than before. And more extra money for economy, for economic growth, and for education, and for the academia. And this is my policy. It will be debated in the government. And we should see the results, hopefully good results, uh, uh, one week from now. Thank you very much, Dori, and all of you. Thank you. I want to thank the Minister of Finance, Dr. Bostein, for sharing with us his economic philosophy and what is behind the thinking of the two-year budget. And I think um, we came here sort of curious about how you have a stable economy and unstable region. What we really learned was how to use the future to get out of a difficult situation in the present. And uh, it's refreshing, it's new, and I think we have a much better understanding. Thank you again. Thank you, Dovid.